Okay, stop right there. It turns out after all this time running LPVOs, we were wrong the whole time because a much better choice was available all along. It's the MPVO, the real do-it-all optic. At least that's what the latest internet trend is telling us and those trends are never wrong. Hey, what's up fellas? I hope you're having an awesome new year. And speaking of out with the old and in with the new, uh, those SPR builds that you've been seeing on socials have been around a long time. I bet you already weighed the pros and cons of this, but you kind of just forgot since LPVOs have been the focus these last few years. So if you're going to look at MPVOs again, this primary arms 2.5-10 GLX is a good representative of that class of optic. Coming from LPVOs that are generally around 10 inches long, this optic is quite a bit longer at 12 and a half inches. Most MPVOs are gonna be about this length as well. Aesthetically, some guys really care about that. However, I think the biggest thing you'll notice is the weight. Overall, it comes in at 22.5 ounces, so it's a little on the heavy side, but the primary difference between an LPVO and MPVO is the weight distribution. Thanks to its larger objective lens at 44 millimeters versus 24, that weight tends to be more front heavy, especially if you run a piggyback mount. This is a 30 millimeter scope, so you'll definitely wanna find the appropriate mount, and there's several available. But since we uh, need QD for our videos, we like the Warren 30 millimeter X scales since they're cheaper than most and the QD levers work well. And while we're mounting it, you're going to want to move it back as far as possible in the rings due to its eye relief. At 2.8 inches, it's about an inch shorter than the Vortex PST LPVO, so you're likely going to want to make up for that by moving it closer to the end of the charging handle. It's still pretty comfortable when you're behind it though. Along with that eye relief, let's talk eye box, more specifically exit pupil. But when guys talk about eye box, it's been my experience that they're really talking about exit pupils since that affects the amount of left right tolerance for their sight picture. As a reminder, to get the exit pupil, you divide the objective lens by the magnet so as you go up in magnification, the eye box is going to get tighter and darker. Knowing this, you can see why the objective lens size is important. Since it's bigger, you're going to have a larger exit pupil. But is it really noticeable from a practical shooting standpoint? Well, on an LPV at 1x, you're going to have a sufficiently large eye box. So even if you have some scope shadow, it doesn't really matter much because the parallax isn't a concern at that kind of range and you're target focused anyway. But when you zoom up for long range, especially past eight or 10, at the top end, the difference can come into play. So it gets a little bit darker. You're simply gonna have a brighter sight picture and more side to side tolerance with an MPVO. The difference is how long you're gonna spend looking through that top end magnification since LPVOs are built for speed and MPVOs are built for comfort. Primary arms rifle scopes are broken up into three classes. The budget SLX line with a acceptable Chinese glass, the mid-range GLX line, which is this scope, with its very good Philippines-based glass, and the top of line PLX line with the Japanese-based glass, uh, which we most recently looked at with their Compact 18. So, Philippines-based glass, like the Vortex PSD that we mentioned, is actually very nice. The clarity in the center is really good and really only falls off towards the very edge of the optic. So I don't think you're gonna be complaining about any distortion here. The color and detail are also quite nice as you really only lose detail once you get past eight or 10X. By the way, while you're zooming up, there's a tiny bit of scope tunneling just as you start zooming up from two and a half. It disappears quickly, so you likely won't notice it under real world conditions. And while we're talking color, I didn't see any color fringing here, although historically, chromatic aberration is not something we're super sensitive about on this channel. When we're trying to find and engage the next target as quickly as possible, especially in the LPVO, we tend to not notice any haloing around any targets. If you did, it had to be a ton. But since MPVOs typically spend more time looking at their target, fringing may come into play. Do you see any of it here? Speaking of seeing, let's talk about that uh, reticle brightness or uh, lack thereof. So it's on full blast right now in max setting, so it's pretty much poop in daylight conditions. Even though the setting offers 10 brightness settings, with the first two being NV, really I'd recommend just run it black since you're not really missing much. But if you're in dusk or low light conditions, then yeah, turn on the illumination since the chevron is illuminated and it's not too busy. So if you're running it without illumination, you have to really depend on the reticle design to stand out since this is our first focal plane optic. For MPVOs, it's generally not a problem since the low end is not 1x. On the PA, your low end is capped at 2.5x, so the reticle is going to be much bigger than 1x and hence easier to find. That doesn't mean it's easy to shoot at CQB distances though. Even though it's listed as a CQB horseshoe, it's been our experience that you can't really shoot CQB very fast with magnification. You can somewhat make it work if you had a daylight bright dot, then you have occluded shooting as an option. But since we don't have that here, you're just left with bracketing the target with that large horseshoe. Then hopefully the next target is still within that field of view so you can quickly transition to over to it. So if you can't use the low end for CQB, what options do you have? Basically you have two options, mount an offset on your rail or receiver at 45 degree-ish 
or mount one on top of your optic, AKA piggyback. And much like the MPVO, offsets aren't a new concept. Uh, for many years, we saw three gun open shooters run them as their second optic. So after all this time, finally, a lot of the tactical guys are starting to adopt it. And they're running into the same pros and cons that the three gun shooters ran into. So the biggest pro is that it allows you to maintain cheek weld with only a slight rotation of the gun. So even though the gun is recoiling a little bit different diagonally now, and your pistol hand is at an angle, it's still plenty fast. Really, the only con of this setup is that you can only use it on your strong side, and you need to find enough rail space to accommodate an offset mount. One last note is uh, if you're running night vision, obviously an offset dot really isn't doable because you can't get low enough. On that note, the other config you're gonna see is the piggyback option. I'm not sure why it's gotten so trendy lately, but I'm guessing a lot of guys are starting to get on a night vision now. If this is you, it's really the only option if you don't want to aim off a laser. There are several piggyback options available, but most require you to buy the associated scope mount like this reptilian mount. Since we like to run the worn QD mounts here for the low cost, the only option that I know of is the Trigicon mount that attaches to the scope body. So despite which mount you get, there's a few things to keep in mind with this setup. First, if you have an optic with a tall turret mount, uh, you're gonna need to clear that, and we barely do with ours. And secondly, if I showed you this setup and you never shot it before, you'd probably notice the problem right away. It's like way too high at over four inches height over bore. So if you're aiming for a head box, your aiming point is not even on target. And like we previously explored with the ACOG video, your chin is likely not even touching the stock. So your recoil control is not that great. So if you put this on timer, you'll see how much difference that can make. Do yourself a favor and set up a course of fire with some CQB distance targets. Here we set up a wide transition so you can get some data by looking through and around your different optic setups. Time. 448. Time. 519. As an additional base of reference, run it with an LPVO at 1x2 so you can get that data point. Time. 411. So you can see that there's a, there's a bit of difference performance wise. So that little course of fire was about how many dots perform as primary optics. But in most cases, offsets are used against a small number of short range targets while you're engaging under magnification with your primary optic. So to put that under the test, typically we'll be engaging longer range targets under magnification and braced for support. And then we'll transition to the close targets using our offsets. Let's see how that shakes out. Time. 474. 474. Okay. Time. 505. And like earlier, let's see what happens when you run it with LPVO just for comparison purposes. For an LPVO, we'll run it two ways. We'll spin down to 1x to engage short range targets. On the second run, we'll leave it magnified. So we'll shoot it occluded. We'll see if that makes a difference. Time. 556. Time. 473. And it does make a difference, looks like. So you can use this occluded shooting method as long as the targets aren't beyond 15 yards or so to keep down your POI shifts. Obviously, you can see that it's faster too versus spinning down. Since we're talking spinning down, let's take a quick look at the controls starting with the magnification ring. This unit does not come with a throw lever, but it does have a raised hump so you can push it with your thumb. It turns really fast considering how much magnification range it has to cover. So you don't really need a throw lever, which is really nice. Next to the magnification ring, you're gonna find a diopter. Just remember this is used to focus a reticle at range. And since we don't have one X on this optic, you don't have to worry about flattening the image like you do with an LPVO. On the left side, you'll find the illumination knob that spins between its 10 brightness settings with an off position in between. The first two are your NV settings. As mentioned earlier, these levels aren't really important during daylight since you can't see the illumination anyway. But if you're working in low light or dust, then definitely make use of the control. Otherwise, just leave it off. Now, next to the illumination knob is one of the controls that LPVOs don't have, and that's the parallax slash side focus knob. On LPVOs, typically parallax is fixed at 125 yards, so anything outside of that, you're gonna have a little parallax, not enough to really truly matter within LPVO range, which is usually within 400 yards or so, but outside of that, you could really use a knob like this, which helps to bring the reticle into the same focal plane as your intended target. 
On the PA, you can adjust the parallax as close as 50 yards, and it goes all the way out to infinity. Last but certainly not least, just because MPVO guys love playing with them so much, let's look at these turrets. In the manual, PA refers to these as the low profile turrets, and I guess that could be accurate if you're comparing it against those like those really tall night force turrets. But compared to something like an LPVO turret, like a Razor, these are pretty chunky, especially the elevation turret. It's almost blocking the view of the piggyback dot, as you can see here. As to the turret functions, I like what they've done here with the locking turrets, as opposed to the push pull that you see in other designs. This one uses the locking triangle button, which is really cool. So when it's popped out, you can't turn it, it's locked, but if you depress it, you release the lock and then you can turn it. When you're done with the elevation knob, you can spin it back down to your zero stop. The windage knob will stop at every zero setting though. And as I mentioned in the manual, since this is a steel on steel design, all the clicks sound and feel really good, although the clicks aren't as loud as some others. So at rest, I didn't feel too much slot between the clicks either. You get 0.1 mils per click and a total of 10 mils per turn, so the ticks are pretty close together. As practical shooters, we don't dial. We use the reticle since time is always a factor and using the reticle is always the fastest. Primary Arms must have understood this because they essentially put an LPVO reticle into an MPVO optic. When you look at the ACSS Griffin Mill reticle, you can see elements that make it more suitable for engagement and speed versus the most absolute precision. Starting with the center chevron, which I know some dudes really don't like because it's hard to shoot groups with it. Uh, I can see their point. It's a pretty big aiming point, dead smack in the center of the reticle. And if you want precision, your only option is to use the tip of the chevron. In an LPVO 1X, it makes sense. Since we don't have that here though, I think a crosshair likely would have made more sense. You also notice the two running man dots to the left and right of the center chevron, which allow you to engage moving targets that are perpendicular to you at a running speed of 8.6 miles an hour. Okay, so I haven't tested this feature yet, so if you got one of those mover targets and seen it work in real time, let me know. And if you want ranging features, this reticle has it in spades. So if you've got the ranging ladders on either side of the horseshoe. All you do is align the target's feet with the bottom hash and whatever number you see there, that is the approximate range in yards. Just remember that. Those are the yard markers, not mills. By the way, I'm not really sure why they're arranging reticles on both sides of the horseshoe since you're really only using one at a time. I'm guessing they did this to balance out the reticle visually. And if you follow the reticle all the way down the tree, you've got these steady arranging lines, a very similar to what an ACOG offers. So put your target's torso between them and you'll have approximate range out to 600 yards. The only thing that's kind of clunky here is that since you you have a mill tree here, you'll have to remember that you start at the bottom of the chevron for the first ranging and you only go down to the four mill stadia line. Finally, for the ranging and dope, you've got the actual mill grid itself and it's really extensive. It goes all the way down to 15 mils. They're clearly labeled with mill markings this time, unlike their previous ranging reticles, which were labeled in yards. So you've got one mil intervals between the big stadia and half mils between the smaller stadia. On the sides, you've got plenty of wind holds in one mil increments with six mils across. So knowing all this, let's put this reticle into practice and actually shoot some long distance with it. We'll use uh, Strelic Pro to get our holds. And as far as ammo and rifle, we're using 175 grain SMKs going 2392 with a 100 yard zero through our 18 inch Arrow M5 308 stainless steel barrel. The app does have this reticle, so be sure to choose it from the list. Just based on these holds, you literally have a hold every 50 yards all the way out to 1000 yards if you want. So now we have our holds. Next step is to test them on our known distance range. Since we're shooting 308, we're gonna push the distance a little bit further than normal. So let's shoot at these uh, C-Zone Ipsics from 200 to 600 yards. We'll correct for misses if need be. Let's give it a go. So Primary Arms is asking 750 for this optic and when you stack it up against other MPVOs, it's seated more towards the upper end of that price range. For sure, it's still cheaper than most LPVOs, but when you look at the other MPVOs and compare it feature by feature, I don't personally think the 750 is really that much more to ask considering what the PA brings to the table. It's, it's just a little bit more feature rich and a little bit more polished. Now, the last thought I'd leave for you today is to consider what you realistically need to do with your optic. You guys have seen us run LPVOs many times on this channel, so our priorities are engage multiple short range targets at speed and have the option to transition to other multiple long range targets. For MPVOs, it's almost the reverse of this at a slower and smaller scale. For example, 
On LPVOs at short range, we use a daylight bright dot for fast engagement at 1x. We may not even run a, a offset or piggyback if the LPVO is your primary uh, daytime optic. For an MPVO, your offset and piggyback red dot is really, you have to use it for daylight illumination since your low end is not 1x. As far as targets in an LPVO, 90% of your targets are less than 50 yards and in, so your optic is gonna spend most of the time at 1x. Your nearest competition to this setup really is a red dot plus magnifier. For an MPVO, 90% of your targets are greater than 100 yards, so your optic will be magnified all the time. Your nearest competition really to this optic is a fixed magnification optic like an ACOG plus a red dot. So for long range shooting, an LPVO is geared towards rapid engagement. So the reticles are built for speed and you never really dial. Your turrets are only used for zeroing. For an MPVO, speed isn't really that important. Your comfort takes priority with your better eye box and field of view. And because of that, the reticle is built typically for precision. Turrets and dialing are typically used. So I think we talked this thing to death, at least from our standpoint. Hopefully some of this was helpful to you. And if it was, give it a like, leave a comment and share it with your friends to keep this small channel growing. And lastly, if you're interested in the equipment seen here, I'll leave it in the description below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys again next time.